St. John Paul II used to say the church had to breathe with two lungs. There's the lung of the west and the lung of the east. During the Cold War, the lung of the east was on the other side of the Iron Curtain, unable to breathe. Christians from both Catholic and Orthodox traditions were persecuted. Despite difficulties, the Byzantine Catholics kept the Eastern traditions, but stayed with Rome. After the fall of the Iron Curtain, the churches reawakened. On a series of trips, including to Romania in 1999 and Bulgaria in 2002, John Paul II worked to revitalize the Eastern Lung. Pope Francis will now return. He'll be in Bulgaria and Macedonia from May the 5th to the 7th, and in Romania from May the 31st to June 2nd. In this special episode, we visit these three countries where Catholics are a minority and the Orthodox are the majority. Three nations where Pope Francis will soon give a boost of oxygen so that the church might breathe with two lungs. North Macedonia's capital city of Skopje, statues of Saint Cyril and Methodius look out over the Vardar River from the stone bridge. On the other side of the river, an enormous statue of Alexander the Great has his gaze set on the city. Although all of this was reconstructed after the 1967 earthquake that brought the city to the ground, Everything here is a reminder of the greatness of Macedonia's past. Even Mother Teresa's childhood home was destroyed during that earthquake. Likewise, the church where she was baptized. Few remember that Mother Teresa was born here in Skopje, into an Albanian family. Mother Teresa Memorial House now stands on the site of what was once her parish church. Uh, mostly we've, we have pictures and we have some documents here and we uh, mostly the personal belongings of her is just we have a sari it's it's for for her clothes for her hair, head uh, which is just right here and uh, mostly we've got pictures and documents. We've got uh, visitors from all over the world and the first thing that when they heard they, well, she was from here, she, she was not from India, it's very, very peculiar for, for them. Pope Francis will visit the Memorial House. He'll also go to the chapel on the last floor of the museum and there he will pray. Arian Aslanai is the director of the Memorial House, and he's a Muslim. He'll be here to welcome the Holy Father on May the 7th. I would like to, to do a prayer, uh, him in, in his religion and I in my religion, to do it together. In North Macedonia, Pope Francis will meet with a plural society. There are two big ethnic groups. 65% of the population is Macedonian. 25% are Albanian. Catholics number just 15,000 out of 2 million people. The majority of the population is Orthodox Christian and affiliated to the Macedonian Orthodox Church. It's actually not recognized in the official communion of Orthodox churches. For this reason, Metropolitan Stefan, the leader of the Macedonian Orthodox Church, doesn't have an official meeting with Pope Francis in his capacity as head of his church. Meetings between the two are expected to take place anyway, though. They already know each other. 
Metropolitan Stefan is always part of the Macedonian delegation that visits the Vatican with the Bulgarian delegation on May the 24th to honor St. Cyril and Methodius. The Macedonian Orthodox Church has substantial grounds. It is known that national freedom is required for people to organize their church. The Archbishopric of Okrida was abolished by the Ottoman Empire in 1767. When this part of Macedonia gained independence as a federal unit of Yugoslavia, the Archbishopric was reinstalled. In 1958, the vicar of Patriarch German was elected ahead of the Macedonian Orthodox Church. The synod was completed in 1967, and the Archbishopric of Orid became the Macedonian Orthodox Church. The Catholic Church and the Macedonian Orthodox Church are in amicable relations. Many members of the Macedonian Orthodox Church have studied in Italy. They have a special bond with Rome. North Macedonia is an ancient land of evangelization. The Apostle Paul was the first to bring the Word of God here. Also, St. Cyril hailed from Macedonia. Together with Methodius, he was the great announcer of the Gospel of Eastern Europe. The Cyrillic alphabet they invented is still a reference point to everyone. Absorbed by Yugoslavia after the Second World War, North Macedonia gained independence in 1991. The state is still looking for its identity. Skopje, the capital, is a reminder of the greatness of the past with its neoclassical buildings, Arabic-like markets in the Muslim bloc, and wide roads that pave the way to the train station, where the clock stopped ticking in the moment of the 1967 earthquake. North Macedonia has been waiting for a long time for this papal visit. It's fascinating that so many years have passed for the preparation of a papal visit. Invitations were sent to St. John Paul II and then to Benedict XVI. In the end, the papal visit is taking place now, in Francis's time. This means that somehow the time has come. It's an historic event. It's the first time a pope will visit Macedonia in 20 centuries. Pope Francis' visit will be short, with the focal point of the visit, Mother Teresa's memorial house. There will be a main, uh, main prayer at the stadium of, of the city, and we are expecting about 40-50 thousand people for that day. <clears throat> Not just from Macedonia, for, for other countries as well. So. A statue of Jesus was set in the church that used to be the place where the Mother Teresa memorial is now. That statue was not destroyed by the earthquake and is now displayed in the new cathedral dedicated to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. When Mother Teresa returned to her native city, she went to the cathedral and prayed in front of the statue. Here, everything began, she said. Mother Teresa will be the center and spiritual connection of Pope Francis' brief visit to the Macedonian lands. He will likely once again underscore the need to build bridges, just like she did. In a few moments, we'll be back with more on Vaticano. Moran Vaticano begins now. There's an area in Sofia, the capital of Bulgaria, called the Quadrangle. It's because in the vicinity you can find a mosque, a synagogue, an Orthodox church, and the Catholic co-cathedral dedicated to St. Joseph. Pope Francis might pass through this quadrangle in the Pope Mobile while here. Indeed, the quad is a clear representation of the soul of Bulgaria. It's a place where the coexistence of religions is the way of life. 
Sì, da noi la maggioranza è ortodossa. The majority of the population is Orthodox. Out of 8 million people, there are also 1 million Muslims. They are mostly Bulgarians, forced to convert to Islam during the Ottoman Empire. We were under the Ottoman Empire for 500 years, but now they feel Muslim. Then there are Protestants, Armenian, Jewish. The coexistence is peaceful. Moreover, I would say there is a remarkable tolerance among all the religious denominations. Catholics are about 1%, which means around 70,000 people. It's fascinating that Catholics are described as people of great faith, though we are not so many. We can compare Catholics to salt. It doesn't have to be much, but it gives flavor to the food. I think Catholics are considered this way, like salt. Certainly, Bulgaria endured one of the most active religious persecutions on the other side of the Iron Curtain. The Catholic Church was almost demolished, but it rose up from the catacombs. Bulgaria now has three dioceses. The Bishops' Conference is called Interritual, because it includes Catholics of the Latin and the Byzantine rites. The Latin rite community originated at the beginning of the 16th century, when a group of Franciscan friars reached Bulgaria. However, Bulgaria actually converted to Christianity much earlier in the 9th century. Rome and Constantinople were not divided yet. King Boris then ruled the country that was for a long time divided between West and East. In the year 870, the Council of Constantinople ruled that the Bulgarian territory had to be under administration of the eastern side of the schism. Bulgaria reunified with Rome from 1204 to 1235 under Pope Innocent III. And after that period, Bulgaria opted again for Constantinople. This historical background helps to understand the problematic ecumenical relations. Today, Bishop Christo Prokov is the Byzantine Catholic Exarch of Sofia Plovdiv. There is a rather good coexistence and tolerance between Catholics and Orthodox. For example, I have known Patriarch Neopet, the current head of the Bulgarian Orthodox Church, since I was a little boy. I am thrilled that he is the Patriarch, since he is a good guy with a profound and robust faith. When we are together, we are friends. When we meet on official occasions, it is clear that we need to respect some distance. Pope Francis is scheduled to meet the Orthodox Patriarch, Neophyte, at the beginning of his visit on May the 5th in the Palace of the Synod that's situated in the square of the Orthodox Cathedral, Alexander Nevsky. The Orthodox Synod made it clear that no Orthodox Christian is allowed to participate in the Holy Father's celebrations. So the Orthodox won't even be able to participate in the Regina Celli prayer that Pope Francis will lead in the Cathedral Square. It isn't by chance that Pope Francis' trip to Bulgaria then is not officially characterized by ecumenical dialogue, but rather by peace. The visit carries a clear stamp of one of France's predecessors, one he never met but with whom he's often compared. The motto of the trip is actually the title of a famous encyclical, Pacem in Terris, or Peace on Earth, from the man known as the Good Pope, Angelo Giuseppe Roncalli, the man who became Pope John XXIII. In Bulgaria, reminders of his presence are everywhere. In 1925, as soon as he was ordained a bishop, Angelo Roncalli got to Bulgaria as the apostolic legate. He brings the message of peace and the message of unity. Bulgarian people remember this and call him the Bulgarian Pope. There's even a church dedicated to St. John XXIII, one of the first in the world to take his name. It's just outside Sofia, on land purchased by Roncalli himself. Then Archbishop Roncalli wanted to establish a seminary there. Eucharistine sisters later built their convent and church on the land. Eucharistine sisters are part of the Congregation of the Byzantine Rite. It was founded by the Italian Vincentian father, Giuseppe Oloati, in 1899. 
Their story is profoundly connected with that of Roncalli in Bulgaria. Monsignor Roncalli was their spiritual father, and they lived in his former apartment during the communist period. When they took our house, the monastery, we had an orphanage with almost 10 girls. Everything was confiscated in two stages. First the orphanage, immediately, and then in the year 1961 the monastery as well. So we moved to the first house that Pope Roncalli had bought to serve as a legation. This house was also confiscated, and there were families who lived there. But after they confiscated our monastery, they left us with this house, and we were there for 30 years, the house, the first house, of Monsignor Roncalli. You can see that we pass everywhere on his footsteps, and that is really something beautiful for us. Roncalli went to Bulgaria as a papal diplomat before the Second World War, although he had already left before the communist takeover. He learned the ecumenical challenges in Bulgaria, and he brought that experience with him when he was assigned to service in Turkey. While here, Archbishop Roncalli would celebrate Mass in the Church of the Holy Trinity, a church of Byzantine rite. Still today in Bulgaria, the effects of communist rule are palpable. During 50 years of atheism, the social life of the church and also what the church used to do, for example, the care for those in need, was forbidden from the church. It was considered a monopoly of state. As soon as things changed, the doors opened. The church, however, lacked experience. Caritas Internationalis came here to lend a hand and provide some financial resources to start living this new experience. There is a real need to live the church because the church lives among the people. In the end, people still need help. There's great poverty here. There's also great spiritual richness that needs to be nourished. And that too is another reason for Pope Francis' visit. Thanks for watching. Stick around for more on Vaticano. Welcome back. You're watching Vaticano. Three days, four stops. Pope Francis' trip to Romania is one of the most logistically complex. The May the 31st to June the 2nd trip was indeed needed. Romania is a country of many souls. There's the Church of Latin Rite and Romanian language that Pope Francis will meet in Bucharest and Yazid. There's the Romanian Greek Catholic Church of Byzantine Rite that Pope Francis will meet in Blaj. Also, there's the Church of Latin Rite and Hungarian language. Pope Francis will celebrate Mass for them at a Marian shrine. These stops are the outcome of the complex history of Romania. In the end, the nation only took its current size after the First World War. Last year was the 100th anniversary of the establishment of Great Romania. There are still nationalist claims and vigorous linguistic minorities. St. John Paul II went to Romania in 1999, but he was only able to be in Bucharest. 20 years ago, Romania was a closed country just out of communism. Romanians did not know very much of the rest of the world, and it is normal to think that your village is the center of the world. During these years, millions of Romanians had to leave their countries for working reasons. Romanians abroad were able to know the Catholic Church as it is, not as it was recounted during the communist era. Those who came back have now a different approach. They also know the mission of the Pope, so we can say that the Pope is coming to visit a more open, more educated Romania, though there are still rural sectors that need to develop. However, we can say the Pope is coming to visit an entirely European country. Romania is a country that goes toward modernity, but it's not modern. There's a great popular piety. Orthodox churches are everywhere, and often people stop in just to say a prayer. 
There are monasteries like that of Stavropoulos in Bucharest city center that miraculously escaped the communist wave of destruction. At the Blage entrance, there's a statue of the Wolf of Rome. Blage has some 20,000 inhabitants. It's not the titular see of the bishop, but the Greek Catholic bishop of Alba Iulia, the old Cardinal Mauresan, lives there. The city was nicknamed the Little Rome. Blage is the Little Rome because it is the heart of the Romanian Greek Catholic Church. Blage is the Little Rome because the Romanian Greek Catholic Church has the vocation to universality, Catholicism, unity. Romanian Greek Catholic Church was born between 1697 and 1701, when the Orthodox Metropolia of Alba Iulia restored the communion with the Apostolic See of Rome. This special bond with Rome was the reason for the martyrdom of the seven Greek Catholic bishops, since they didn't want to reject their union with the Pope. Bishop Claudio Pope, auxiliary of Blaj, clearly speaks about the wounds of the Romanian Greek Catholic Church. I, first of all, refer to the recent history of the Church, that is, the communist persecution. It was an extremely tough period for priests, laity, monks, nuns, bishops. That persecution sought to suppress the Greek Catholic Church. The persecutors did not take into account the fact that the Church is built on the same stone as the promise of Christ. Christ promised that hell would not prevail. The Romanian Greek Catholic Church flourished thanks to culture. In Blaj, there's the second Bible ever translated into the Romanian language, the first translated by the Greek Catholics. It's in the Cyrillic alphabet. The Bible of Blaj is very important for at least two reasons. First of all, it is a reference point to understand the evolution of Romanian language. It is written in a beautiful Romanian language, and then it is crucial from the ecumenical point of view. Because of its high quality, the Romanian Orthodox Church also adopted that translation. The Bible was recovered after the fall of the communist regime, and now it sits in the cathedral's library. The library, too, has been re-established. Communists had seized everything, and many texts were lost. Until 1979 to 80, our congregation did not accept novices. It was risky, and the Mother Superior and other nuns were arrested during communism. Step by step, the fear diminished, and so the congregation accepted new novices. I joined the congregation with a group of friends, but I stayed in my family in secret. Not even my parents knew about that. Even the Orthodox Church endured the regime. In Romania, the ecumenism of blood Pope Francis often talks about has been experienced. The communist experience was a traumatic experience for Romanian Christianity, for Orthodox Christianity here, but we have a lot of examples of the people that were in prison and were of different confessions of faith, but still they, they, they con confessed Christ till, uh, till death. death. And uh, it is very important that the Pope remembers our sufferings. Pope Francis will meet Orthodox Patriarch Daniel on May the 31st, the first day of his trip. They will go together to the new Orthodox Cathedral, still under construction. St. Pope John Paul II was the first donor for the construction of the cathedral. Pope Francis and Patriarch Daniel will pray the Our Father together in front of this unfinished building. The question, however, remains, will ecumenical dialogue in Romania move forward? Will Christians indeed be united? I asked Cardinal Koch, President of the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Unity of Christians, what is ecumenism today? He answered with a comparison. If you look at a plane above us and there are no clouds around, it seems that the flight is not moving. Ecumenism is like this. It seems nothing is moving, and then something happens, and so you move forward. The hope is that Pope Francis' visit will help a renewal of this ecumenical path, just as St. John Paul II's visit did. Ah, te abbiamo visto.
We saw that the effect of St. John Paul II's visit was more than what we expected. Catholic and Orthodox faithful said, Unitate, Unitate, in front of John Paul II and Patriarch Theoctist. It was a spontaneous cry of faithful that were asking to the churches to let go of the things that were putting us one against the other and to get back to the essence of giving a common witness to the Church of Christ. Now neither us nor the Orthodox Church can have excuses. We are called to find a common path to unity. Pope Francis will travel to Romania to foster and revive the spirit of unity of the country. The motto of the visit is Sa Mergum Impreuna, let us walk together. Pope Francis' trip has the task of encouraging this walk together on the path of unity. Thank you.